Can we dim the lights, please? Oh, and by the way, for, uh, every, anybody watching on the media, our link is back up. So Ronald, our hero technical guy, says, so if you don't want to do Facebook, you can actually go back onto those links. So I think we need to kill, kill these lights too. And is that, is that, that, works, good, is that good enough that for you? Right. right, over to you, sir. All right. <clears throat> Well, I'll give you a little, uh, a little background that uh, loved astronomy for a long time. And one of the things that's interesting about when you read prophetic material, and we'll get to that a little bit later, but that Jesus, I, I title this, The Creator is Returning Soon. Because Jesus certainly is the creator. We learn that from several passages, which we will discuss. But when it comes, my goal today is a couple things. In order to introduce us to the majesty of who God is, and also to Jesus being the creator. And as we get going, I would say, in the, the rest, as, as far as we can, in the end of the age, uh, Jesus said that there would be signs in the heavens. The, the very powers of heaven would be shaken. And one of the things that, <clears throat> that we're looking forward to discussing, or at least to filming, would we say that way, photographing, is, you know, there's, there's, there's comments out there about the asteroid Apophis, that is, is, it is scheduled to come near Earth on uh, Friday the 13th, uh, a, uh, April, Friday, April 13th, Friday the 13th of 2029. And so uh, certain people have made comments that they believe strongly that, that Apophis is, that they had a vision from the Lord. Uh, I can't verify any of that necessarily, but that Apophis would be part of Revelation chapter 8, verse 3 as it relates to Wormwood. So that comes into play, some very interesting things. Uh, we'll be able to photograph Apophis when it comes around. It's already been photographed uh, by other amateur uh, photographers and stuff. And so we'll be able to do that when it comes around in the right way. But I'll show you kind of what the Lord has blessed us with. I think maybe I'll go, is it, let's see which way. Sometimes I've got to remember is it that way or, Graham, I'm feeling your pain here. All right. I'm pr let's see. On there, okay. Now we're going, yeah, down, right? Yeah. All right, I'm pressing down. Nothing, you guys are. This is we got to have this working. It's, uh, I'm not sure, Ronald, why. Let me try it the other way. Nope, you want to restart it, maybe? Escape and then function five should bring it back up. Function F5. We'll start the, I'm seeing some great pictures here on my screen. There we go. Okay. Let's see if I can go up. There we go. Okay. So this is uh, our observatory. It has a, a roof that just rolls right off. And uh, for the sake of time, I had a video that showed it. I took a drone and it took a drone image of watching it, but this is, this is what it looks like. So if you get a visual, we, we decided not to do a dome because a dome draws attention. And so when this is closed, it just looks like a shed. And so in the sense for safety and uh, for people thinking or wondering what is in there, uh, this is a picture of what our system looks like. You can see Gary and I. Gary and I are pretty short, okay? We, we, we acknowledge it, but um, this makes us look really short. Because we're short, but not that short. But because the other couple standing closer to the camera, I'm like, man, Gary, <laughs> between the two of us here, this is pretty amazing. But you, we can, uh, I'm five foot five. I mean, that's, you know, whatever. But we definitely can stand near, the walls are eight feet tall. And uh, so this is the system that we have. Uh, and actually what we've done just recently is the one on the right is a white refractor, and we actually, I got, um, I got greedy in, in, the, in the one sense. So I sold these, and I upgraded to something bigger. And so it, this is actually what we have now is even a little bit bigger than that. Um, but it was able to, the, the cost was the same, so it was really nice. Okay, so why are we doing this? Because Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. And the skies above show forth this handiwork. Now, I want you to think about David wrote this in around 3000 BC. 
I'm, no light pollution back then. Great. So as David is looking up at the skies, he writes this. And on average, in a dark site, you might see three or 4,000 stars. Beautiful, right? The Milky Way. Stunning. But even as he's looking up and seeing that, I can tell you that he's not seeing what we're going to see. And so the majesty of God, the glory of God, really has been hidden for all of human history until the current technological age, which really began, let's say, around 1900. They've, been, they've had telescopes before and then, and they could see them. But if you look at something through a large telescope, um, you get kind of a general, uh, you can get a general framework of something like a galaxy. But our eyes are small. Even though the telescope's big, our pupils are very small. So we're not able to capture uh, color very well, but when you photograph it and you open the lens up and you spend 20 hours allowing the light to absorb, you get to see what's really, really there. Again, our eyes aren't designed for that. And so I'll give you a couple examples of what we have seen. This was uh, one of the first images that I took with the white refractor. We have another one that is a, um, an 11 inch scope. Uh, this is just called the Wizard Nebula. And what you see, you, it, it's kind of think about maybe a wizard floating off to the left. You know, you, people name these things, okay? It's like looking at the constellations. Uh, the, big, the Great Bear, it doesn't necessarily look like a bear, but this is what you have. This was a, another image that we took where th these two galaxies, again, 12 million light years away, right near the Big Dipper, beautifully stunning. Uh, this is where, again, we were just getting into some of the, the early images. Trying to, I was trying to, honestly, I was trying to figure out how to use this stuff. And I had to learn um, this one called the Pac-Man Nebula. And uh, it looks like a Pac-Man, right? And just beautiful, rich, rich colors that, uh, and I'll, I'll say this, Oklahoma, where we live, uh, Oklahoma has good skies, but not great skies. It's not like I, we're in Idaho or maybe in the, in the middle of the desert. So, but what's happened now is the technology that, that what we're seeing like with this is stuff that 20 years ago only a university could have. And now the, really I would say in one sense, the average person can, can come and, and be taking pictures uh, of, of stuff like this. The Triangulum Galaxy, three million light years away, just what, what we see now is astronomers will estimate that there's over two trillion, trillion galaxies like this in God's universe. And each galaxy will contain between 100 and 200 billion stars. So you do the math and it's a lot of zeros, okay, in that regard. But <clears throat> when we think about what God has done, again, David writing, even in Psalm 8, David says, when I look up at the heavens and I, and I see the work of your hands and I see all the beauty up there, which again, we're seeing things that they didn't see. He says, well, what's man? What's mankind that you even care about him? When I see all of that, all that grandeur, what is significant about us? And that's what we want to talk about today is because God reminds us how significant. Now, you can see the colors so, now this, this is, okay, this is Hubble, okay? This isn't ours, okay? This is Hubble. This is a billion dollar scope, right? Billion pounds or more, but this is ours. So, we go back, that's Hubble, and this is from our backyard. Yeah. Those colors are real. I did not do any fabrication on these colors. And the, what I've tried to do is there's different, you, you can use different cameras to focus in what they call a narrow band imaging where you take a particular uh, wavelength of light and you just absorb that. But I've tried, not that that's bad, but I have always felt that's not pure because then I'm, I'm focusing on this where this is just a one shot color no fabrication. And this image is, is the Orion Nebula. It was only two hours. It's, it's so bright. It's so beautiful. And, and it looks okay there. It looks good there. 
but it looks even more beautiful on the screen, you know, because it's going through. But this, I mean, you, you, you see this and, and you're just like, Lord, God is a magnificent artist. And what we see in the biological world, you know, going down to a, you know, maybe a beetle that's beautiful colors or even snakes, if you like snakes, all the beautiful colors of birds, everything we see in the, in the biological world, we see it out in the universe. And yet we are the first really end of the age generation that is seeing these things. No one else in history, you think about all of human history, no one's got to appreciate God the way we can. And we go, man, Lord what you've created is absolutely stunning. This is the Dumbbell Nebula. I just took this about three or four months ago. It took me about 20 hours. But those are real colors. I didn't do anything. This is, this is how it looks. And it's so stunning. That the, the, if, you, if you zoom in on, on this, on the, on the big file, it, it, the precision and the resolution is just absolutely Incredible. This one's called the Rosette Nebula. And God just puts these up there. And, and you think about this. He puts them up there in a good way to show off. To show off His majesty. Again, the, the, the heavens declare the glory of God. When we think about the glory of God, we think about Him being a, not only a creator, we certainly think about His glory as it relates to His redemption. But... This, th these colors, and uh, it's like an artistic palette he just throws out there. And I'll show you, we'll, we'll get to a couple other things in a moment. Now, this one, is a, this one is a narrow band. This is hydrogen alpha gas, which shines very red. And this one was called the Flying Dragon Nebula, so I had um, thought about Revelation 12, you know, the red dragon <laughs> that you see in there and uh, but just just amazing the details and it's not just a bunch of gas that is diffuse equally everywhere but God has designed them to create very intricate colors in in, in palettes this one is called the elephant trunk nebula it's very uh, it's often very photographed but if, again, if you zoom in on the left, on the left side of the image is most people, they'll zoom in pretty close. The camera that we have is very wide and I could, I could crop it if necessary, but they'll come and they'll film just that little section because, and they'll call it the elephant trunk. Again, just beautiful. And, and Bob, um, you know, our CEO, is he, he's very supportive of what we're doing. And again, we're trying to help people understand and to, to see the glory of God. And, and he said, well, Mondo, Mondo, you know, how many, how many of these are there? And I go, millions. I could spend the rest of my life. I don't have enough nights left in the rest of my days to get even a handful of what we can get because they're available. And, of course, you got to have clear skies, so not every night is clear. And then in order to get a good image like this, this will take, you know, 24 hours. So you do eight hours tonight. If it's clearer, you'll do eight hours again tomorrow night and eight hours the next night. And what, what happens, well, the way it works is the technology now is so sophisticated that the, the big mount that I was standing under, I just, I, I literally, I just go to the computer. I say, okay, go here, zzz, goes right there. And then it tracks it perfectly all night long. It keeps it right in the center the whole night. And then at, when I'm done, I just I stop recording. And then the next night I come back, go there again. It goes right back, and it just adds. And then you take the images together and you stack them uh, in a in a program, and then it, it produces something like this. So let's step back for a moment because <clears throat> I want to show you a video. But this is Genesis one, and. God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Let them be, let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, which we know as the sun and the moon. And then it says, and the stars. I think, well, Lord, usually you're a little bit more dramatic than that, 
But God says he did this, he created the sun, he created the moon, and it's, it's, it's just one, it's like two really short words in Hebrew. And the stars, you're like, just whew. I mean, what did you do on Wednesday afternoon? That's what God did. He just went like this and, and, and created, you know, one with 25 zeros of stars. And that's the power of our God. And that's what I want us to see. The question that, that this, is very, this is going to be very practical, even though it's beautiful. And I hope we're in awe, not only of God's uh, majesty and of his glory, but what we're going to see is I, I want us to walk away in being in awe of God's power and His wisdom and His love specifically toward us. And ultimately, life has challenges, right? And it always comes to me when I'm, when I'm out there and I see this and, I, and I, I pull up the initial image and I'm like, oh, wow. I just go, God, you're awesome. And the question for us today, it really in any situation, is how big is your God? Yeah, but, yeah, but, but I, God says, oh, am I, am I, has my arm been shortened that I can't rescue you? Don't, I mean, it, you, we, we think about what God said to Job. Job, when you look up at the scars, you see Pleiades, you see Orion, you see the bear. Were you there when I bound them together? No, no, I wasn't. He says, do you think if I created all these, I can't, I can't minister to you? That I don't know what's going on in your life? That your problem is so big? Look what I did on a Wednesday, just again in a second. This and the stars also. There's over 300,000 stars in this one cluster. And it's, what's awesome about this one is, you can, as you can see it's so much better here, maybe later if you want I'll show it to you on my phone, where if you zoom in, you can zoom in and zoom out and it shows you the three-dimensional nature of this, the cluster. You just keep going, it's like little diamonds. The, the closer you get in there, like, oh, there's another layer, and, and they keep going back and forth. And 300,000, and these, these globular clusters, they're, they're all, they don't actually sit in, in our Milky Way galaxy. They sit above, and they don't really know. It's kind of fun when you take astronomy. They don't really know exactly how they got there, but God does. And he just creates these. And you can see, actually, you can see, if you look at this particular one, if you know where to look, you can see it with your naked eye, and it just looks like a little blob of gray. And then you bring the telescope on it, and this is beautiful, even without a camera, and you can zoom in on it, and you just go in and out on the focus, and you can see all of the stars. This is, these are, I like looking at these because they're actually, they're, even though they're beautiful in, a, in an image, they're just as beautiful looking through a telescope. And this is our sun. We took a picture of this, and uh, you can see all the intricate details uh, of, of the sun's surface. Now, clearly, you can go to NASA, and NASA has pictures of the sun, but what's awesome is we took this. And you can see along the edge, this is with the special uh, hydrogen alpha filter that you put uh, on the, right, as, as you're coming out of the telescope before the camera. I don't know if you can see it on the left, the, the prominences that, that are shooting off of the sun and then gravitation, they're coming out and they, and they get sucked back down. And, and of course, you can see some sunspots. But you think about, again, in ancient times, they, they couldn't see any of this. And yet God's saying, I created this to keep you alive. All the mechanisms there to keep you uh, going. So what do we learn from this? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. This is a reference to Jesus. And as we think about Jesus returning, oftentimes we can, uh, as, as Sean mentioned, we, we, we might have this Jesus you know, coming as a baby or coming in there. Uh, you know, with the two sheep as a shepherd. Jesus is the creator. He, he made all of this. He's the one that just whipped it out on a Wednesday afternoon. He's the one that came down and became human, became our Savior, died for us. He's also the one that's coming back. And it's interesting in, in Revelation 
19, and then we see it in Psalm 2, that the nations, when they're gathered together in a place called Armageddon, they, they, in Revelation 19, it says that they gather together to make war against him who's sitting on the white horse. And in Psalm 2, you know, the, the, David again, why, why do the nations rage? Why do they plot this vain thing to make war against the Lord and his anointed, his, his Messiah? And what does God do? He laughs. Bunch of fools. That would think, I mean, really, the one who created the very sun, who created an un, un, unfathomable amount of stars, you really think you're going to go to war against him? Hebrews chapter 1, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. So I want to, I want to show you, watch this, this video. Well, that didn't go the way we wanted. Um, you want to go back to that and just, I guess we can try it. Let's see. It should just start. Oh, I want to get to see the pictures again. Okay, and it should ready go. There we go. Between 1921 and 1929, Mount Wilson Observatory was the site of some of the most important discoveries in the history of astronomy. Here, more than a mile above Los Angeles, Edwin Hubble used this telescope to revolutionize scientific understanding of the structure size and origin of the universe. Working tirelessly from his wicker chair, Hubble determined that our Milky Way galaxy, thought by many astronomers to constitute the entire universe, was actually just one of countless billions of galaxies in a vast cosmic sea. Hubble also demonstrated that these galaxies were receding from each other a fact that strongly implied the universe had a definite beginning. For a better perspective of the cosmos Edwin Hubble unveiled, let us embark on an imaginary journey from the top of Mount Wilson to the farthest reaches of the known universe. Traveling at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, how long would this journey take? Albert Einstein demonstrated that time would be dramatically altered for anyone traveling at such a speed. But for the sake of simplicity, we'll set aside this effect by measuring time with earthbound clocks. We depart Mount Wilson on January 1st. Hurtling through space, we quickly pass the orbit of Mars in just 4 minutes 30 seconds. We continue on, past Jupiter and the other gas giant planets, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And five hours and 30 minutes after leaving the Earth, we fly past Pluto and its companion moon. Our journey has taken us more than three and a half billion miles to the outer limits of our solar system. And back at Mount Wilson, it's still January 1st. We now take our first steps into interstellar space. Behind us, our neighboring planets and the sun quickly disappear from view. The void of space is broken only by the glimmer of stars so distant they do not yet appear to move, even though we continue to travel at the speed of light. A year passes then two years, three, four years. Finally, on April 19th of the fifth year, we reach the Alpha Centauri system, the nearest stars to our sun. We have traveled nearly 25 trillion miles, 
yet our journey has barely begun. We are now 10 light years from the sun, far enough out in space that the stars within our galaxy appear to converge. 100 light years from the sun, patterns of gas and dust from an arm of the Milky Way galaxy surround us. 1,000 light years, the galaxy's arms and central disk become more defined. Yet it is not until we travel at the speed of light for 100,000 years that the entire spiral shape of the Milky Way is recognizable. From here on, each point of light we see is no longer an individual star, but an entire galaxy composed of billions of stars. 5 million years after beginning our journey, the Milky Way is recognized as part of a cluster of at least 30 galaxies, known as the Local Group. Bound together by gravity, the galaxies that comprise the Local Group span a region of space more than 3 million light years across. Fifty million light years out, we encounter the large Virgo cluster, containing more than 2,000 galaxies. And so it goes, as we continue to travel deeper into the cosmos. We pass cluster after galactic cluster, each a building block of a far greater framework. A billion years pass. Five billion. 10 billion. Finally, after 14 billion years, we are able to discern the large-scale structure of the entire universe. At least 100 billion galaxies stretch in thread-like chains across the cosmos, forming a tapestry of unimaginable dimensions. Today, scientists still ponder the source of a universe where uniformity and precisely balanced laws and constants enable us to survey its size and structure, to contemplate its origin, and to appreciate the profound reality of our existence within it upon a remarkable blue planet, well suited for both life and discovery. Awesome. Now, while all that stuff arranged itself by accident, I'm sure, couple questions that come to mind, you can actually bring the lights up if you want, is uh, do you feel small? <laughs> and it also helps us to just get an image of God's majesty. Because as big as all that is, God holds it in His hand, right? And this, this, this is the power of understanding, again, when the Bible speaks about the heavens declare that we look at David, and, and when we get there on that day, we're going to come up to Dave, and we'll say, David, I appreciate you, know, appreciate you writing Psalm 19. Appreciate you writing Psalm 8. Well, maybe you might have a different perspective then. But David, let me tell you what it's really like. Let me tell you what you didn't get to see. Let me tell you, you, you said that declared the glory of God. Let me show you an infinitely greater perspective of how awesome and majestic God is. It's interesting, he, he mentions in there again, just some, I would say, out of date information 100 billion galaxies. No, it's over 2 trillion. And that's just because, at their best estimate, that's even low. Because the more, the, the thing that's holding us back is like even late, latest, the James Webb telescope has is, is brought tremendous things. And it's helping us to see resolutions that were never there before. 
But even that, if we had a bigger telescope, we would see even more. So the whole thing's holding us back is technology. And as, you know, if the Lord tarries, I hope during the millennium that he allows me to be a part of building the biggest telescope ever in the history of humanity. Say, Lord, I'll take that job. Can we do it? You know, because can, can, again, the goal, imagine, imagine if humanity actually took the time and the energy and the resources and used all the technology to point to God. And we know that right now NASA doesn't. The European, European Space Agency doesn't. They do these things, and I appreciate the, the, what they have done, but they're not up there saying, look how awesome God is. Look how awesome the Creator is. Look how awesome the Lord Jesus is. And so we know that there's limits, but we know during the millennium that the whole earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord, and that is going to be exciting. I'll show you a couple other little things here just on the bottom. You know, mankind is, is depending on your view, but whether we've been to the space or been to the moon, okay, I'm not going to get into all that. There's a lot of arguments back and forth. But what we do know is that as man has, has gone into, and even right now at the, at the International Space Station, the fastest that mankind has ever traveled is 25,000 miles per hour, which is 6.8 miles per second versus the speed of light is 186,000. But the time it would take at the fastest that we've gone in a rocket ship to get from the, from the Earth to the Sun is five months. But remember I was talking about the nearest star, the, the Proxima Centauri, the Alpha Centauri system. It's 4.2 light years away. Well, it would take, it takes light 4.2 years to get there. It would take us 114,858 years to get there on a rocket ship. We'd be dead. What God has done is he's, he's made the universe, and that's kind of the question. Why did he make it so big? Do you don't have the answer. Part of it is, I think, to show off in a good way. <laughs> to say, do you get it? And even now, do, 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 you, do you see how big God is? Now, in, in all this, the reason I wanted to show, especially this video, is there's a couple passages in Scripture that speak, will be speaking to us personally. Here we see that certainly the universe shows forth the power of God, right? The, 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 the intelligence of God, the, the, the fine-tuning of the entire universe and how it works, even uh, as this video showed it, it ended, the, this is a video from a, a, um, a, a documentary called The Remarkable Planet, where it's talking about all the fine-tuning that you have of Earth to have life. It doesn't happen on accident. There's no room for evolution here. At all. And this is, this is where Romans 1, 20 through 22 comes in. They profess themselves to be wise, but they became fools. And that's not, a, that's not a, a mean statement. It's just a true statement. Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, what? There is no God. I mean, it, it's so... And they know better. This is why, again, in, in that Romans 1 passage, it says that the invisible attributes of God are clearly seen. God shows it to them, but they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now, the, the Greek word suppress there is the idea, and all of us have done this. You get a, well, in, in America, we call them beach balls. What do you call them here? Beach balls. Beach ball, okay. okay. You never know. You never know. I'm upstairs getting all the things of, of how I, I'm not pronouncing things right or different things. So a beach ball. But if, you, if you're at the water... And you, and you take a beach ball and you hold it under water, what happens if you let go? It, it pops up. So to keep it under water, you have to keep holding it down. It takes effort. That's what the word suppressing there means. The truth of God as the creator is just for, trying to force it and pop itself up. But mankind, because of their foolishness, they're having to force it down. They know when, when you study biology or you study DNA, the digital nature of the cell. They know what it means. You don't get information from nothing. It, it's impossible, and they know this. They go, well, there has to be a mechanism. Have we ever experienced any other mechanism anywhere that can get um, order and intelligence out of chaos? Well, no. So why would you think here that it's going to be there? They, they suppress it, and God says, He's shown it to them. That's why they're without excuse. And so for us, what I want us to see, the heavens are declaring God's power. 
his wisdom and his love. And we know Colossians 1, for by him all things were created. This is talking about Jesus in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. That's all the angelic realm. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him the universe is held together. Now what I find fascinating is that somehow, I don't know all the, the, the details of it, that Jesus is sitting there in the manger and he's holding the universe together still. He was able in his deity to make all that happen, but yet somehow cloak it all so that he could come down and live the 33 years to be a human for us and again, and to earn righteousness. Now, there's only two verses in the Bible that speak this way. It speaks about God's wisdom. What we just saw, the grandeur in the gigantic, infinite, unfathomable for our human minds, the size of the universe. It's just tough for even us to see the size of our local, our, our, our own galaxy. But God says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts your thoughts. Now, when Isaiah's writing this, and he's looking up, or David's speaking, and he's looking up at the heavens, we could go, oh, yeah, 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 look at, look at, the, look at, this, look at the Milky Way. Yeah, you can see it sometimes, and it's really dark. Back then, you could see it all the time. And if you, if you know where to look, you can see, for example, the Andromeda Galaxy with the naked eye. And, and they're looking at this, and they're going, oh, wow, as high as the heavens are above the earth, that's how much wiser God is than us. And we go, Isaiah, let me tell you what I just saw. All you're seeing is with your naked eye. Now, for us, God is saying, I'm giving you the insight of the true grandeur of who he is. We now have at least a better understanding of how high are the heavens above the earth to us. Infinitely higher than Isaiah understood. So for us, I guess what I'm saying ultimately is, Isaiah and David, I appreciate what you said. And you know what? Hey, you did, you did what you could. But you want to talk about faith? Of all people, we should have the most faith of anybody. Because we now can get a glimpse of what God is saying. And in the same way, I think often we know the challenge, I mean for myself, that we often can think in terms of human wisdom. Like, oh, I got it figured out. Okay, Lord, yep, yep, I know exactly what you're doing. And, and we believe and we, we convince ourselves that God is doing this way. And God's just going, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts aren't your thoughts. As high as the heavens are, that's how different and that's how powerful he is. And that's how uh, he, he could say again often, is anything too wonderful for the Lord to do? Has my arm been shortened? This is, to me, this is the essence of having faith in the Lord. Because the Bible says, again, we walk by faith and not by sight. And so when we come to, th this is, to, for me, as I'm out there at night, I think, man, Lord, um, you're really taking away all the excuses that I could have to have no faith. Because he's revealing all these things and then you come to the truth of scripture and when we are, when we're put into a corner, and this is kind of a pastoral moment, when we're put into a corner as we always are at one time in our lives and we come to that, that moment of desperation and we say, where's God at in all this? I, I can't see or understand what he's doing here. I hope that you think back to that video in Isaiah 55. It's not a lack of power, right? We know that God has all the power. And we know that, well, there, there's this kind of uh, argument that I remember taking this in philosophy class where we'll, we'll say, well, yeah, maybe God's all powerful, but he can't help me in my problem because he's not smart enough. You go, well, I mean, I guess hypothetically, but we, we know here that God's wisdom, clearly God is infinite. 
in his wisdom to create all these things, not only at that macro level of the universe, but also at the micro level with DNA. I mean, we, as smart as we are, we know very little. And God's like, yeah, you're, still fig you're not even caught up a tenth of a percent yet. But the, 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 God says, I want you to study nature because as we study nature, we get a picture and a glimpse of his glory. And we go, you know, Lord, I don't, I don't need to know it all, but I know enough that your arm isn't too short, that there isn't anything too wonderful for you, that your wisdom, yeah, I, 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 you know, in my, in my grand nature, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. We look and we go, oh, no, the Lord, he has earned, and he's worthy of the benefit of the doubt. And this is the other passage. There's two passages. One speaks about his wisdom, but this one... This one is touching because he says, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, and now we have a glimpse of what that is, far more, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. And we, go to, we can go to David or, or, or the psalmist and say, yeah, you guys looked up and you guys saw that, that measure, that ruler stick, of God's love, and you, you had that, but how about for us? The, the ruler that we have, at least from what we understand, is at least 14 billion light years out. And God says, yeah, come here, come here. Uh, did you see that video? Mm -hmm. Can you comprehend how high that is? I can try, Lord. He's, no, you can't. But you can try. That's, that's good. That's how much I love you. That level and you go, Lord, I can't really grasp it. He goes, I know. You're never going to grasp how much I care about you, how much I love you, how much so great is my hesed. This is the word hesed. It's the steadfast, loyal love towards those who fear him. I'm going to pull up on my phone. I didn't put it on here. I apologize for the rest of this passage. It's, it's one of the the most amazing, I think, in the entire Old Testament. Starting in verse 8, it says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will He keep His anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His steadfast love towards those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, and he remembers that we are but dust. As for man, his days are like grass, he flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear Him and His righteousness to children's children, those who keep His covenant and remember to do His commandments. And then the psalmist goes back, The Lord has established His throne in the heavens, and His kingdom rules over all. And so I think for me, I would think about really the Psalm 19 project is the Lord allowing us to continue to share, again, wonderful pictures and the beauty and, and the, the, the creativity and the artistry, but also at the end of the day that we would feel this small in comparison to the Lord's greatness. But also to know that all of this isn't just for that, but it's, it's for God to come down and say, do you understand my power? Do you understand my wisdom that I have it all figured out and, and it's going to all work exactly what we've seen? God moving through history, through nations, as Graham showed, through people, raising them up, but ultimately coming to the point that as we understand the, the, the majesty of the creation, he says, that's my love for you. Let's pray, shall we? Father in heaven, we do... We just stand in awe of you. It is absolutely beyond our comprehension, your great love towards us. 
I ask, Lord, that you would continue to increase our faith, that you would continue to help us to see how you, how we're learning this, this, this weekend, how you desire for us to be a part of your story, that it's, we're not just looking back and seeing all the ways you worked in, in all these other people, but that you've called us to be a part of this time. Here we are at the end of the age. We are the generation that Jesus said many would long to see. And we get to be a part of it. We get to watch and we get to really herald, herald your coming. We do look forward to the blessed hope. We look forward to that time when we hear the trumpet sound as we're learning today. The shout of the archangel where you call us home when we come to be wrapped right up into your arms. We thank you, Lord, for that steadfast love. We all pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.